Welcome back YouTubers. On this episode of My Home Theatre, I'll be doing a long-term review on the Onkyo TX-NR515. Do I still like it? What are the issues with it? Let's find out. Bit of a long video today folks, so use these links to jump to a section that interests you. I've had the Onkyo Amplifier for over 18 months now. Built in late 2012 and I picked this up in September 2013. I find that it's a great amplifier but with a few issues. With 130 watts per channel at 6 ohms, it incorporates 4K upscaling, 8 HDMI inputs along with 3D, Dolby Pro Logic and a lot of different um, Dolby and DTS modes. Featuring 8 HDMI inputs with one on the front and 7 on the back, they're all assignable. And the reason I got this amplifier is because of the dual HDMI out. It can do to one source, one different thing, say your PlayStation, and to the other source, it can do like a movie, which is great in my situation where I've got some kids and um, maybe my son wants to do PlayStation, so he might do it on the big screen, and my daughter, she might want to watch um, some Fetch TV, and so she can do it on the TV. With a two zone system, the amplifier is capable of doing power to that zone, that is to say that you can actually power some speakers in the main room and the secondary zone room. You can do internet radio connectivity with this amplifier, albeit with a few issues, as well as Apple um, AirPlay. Other features of this amplifier are 40 FM AM presets, Odyssey 2 EQ room correction, crossover adjustments, AV sync, HDMI through and standby mode and lots of other stuff. The remote control features a wealth of buttons, however, not everything is represented here. As you'll see next time on my Harmony Remote Control review, there is actually a lot of discrete infrared commands that can come from a remote control, but I guess being a sort of entry-level amplifier, they chose not to put everything on here, which is kind of disappointing. Getting into the setup of the amplifier, you see here you've got network services. Now let me just say off the bat, the network on this only works really well if you have an Ethernet cable going directly into the amplifier. I did purchase a Wi-Fi little dongle, but I found that it didn't work um, consistently with it, and if anything, it failed to recognize it when it powered up. It had a day where it would, a day where it wouldn't, so I got rid of that, and I eventually just bowed to uh, Ethernet cable. Uh, you can use USB into the device, so you can actually play um, some movies off there, music off there, um, look at photographs, but it's a bit clunky and I don't think it's really um, as good as some uh, interfaces can be. The next mode is Insta Preview. This is great if you've got multiple inputs coming in and you want to uh, maybe quickly switch from one to the other. So as you can see here, it's showing uh, Fetch TV down the bottom with a rather racy looking advert. We've got the PS4 and the Apple TV. Returning to the home menu, let's get into the uh, setup menu. It's in here where you can customize this amplifier really, really well. And for $650, I've got to say it's a good feature set. So looking at our ins and outs, we've got our assignments that we can do. First of all, because it's got the dual zone, you can say to it, I only want the main to, say in my case, the projector. Uh, I want to send uh, the picture to the um, TV or I want to send it to both. Okay, and as you can see here, and one of the issues I have, is that the resolution, depending on what you choose, will um, uh, cause some issues. So I used to have in this home theater my Apple TV 3, which I unfortunately had to move to my TV room. And the reason was this. The Apple TV, in, even though I told it to please stay on 720p, because I haven't got good internet, so I can't always stream down 1080, um, it just kept on reverting back to 1080. Now, I don't know if that was the Apple TV's fault or the amplifier's fault, but nonetheless, if there was a conflict in resolution, this amplifier would always default to 1080. And that meant my streaming from Apple TV would slow right down and would just become unusable. So I found with the Apple TV 2, it was actually able to always consi consistently stay at 720. Looking at the HDMI inputs, You'll notice that I've only got four things connected. Now each one of these is assignable. Say for instance, I have connected to HDMI 2, um, uh, something that's quite different and I have got it in a different position. So I can change it and as you can see I can move it up in its different space. 
but let's just put it back to two because that's where it belongs. The names on the left hand side are just rudimentary. You actually can configure, as you can see, the names of the inputs. This is just the menu level where it doesn't seem to reflect the names that you've actually inputted. Coming back, um, there's component video input, which obviously I no longer use, and digital audio input, which I um, handle everything just through my HDMI cables, so I have no need for any digital audio inputs. Let's go back to the main level, and now you can have a look how the speaker setup works. Uh, you can configure the speaker settings here, so you've got the typical large, small, high, low, um, are they powered, etc, etc, and how do you want your Zone 2 configured. Looking at the speaker configuration, um, is we're telling it, yes, we have a subwoofer, and we're telling the amplifier what the crossover point of each of these um, speakers is at. Now, that can be configured by using the um, uh, the auto calibration tool but after you've done that I found it was actually best to come here and tweak it a bit based upon what it sounded like. Speaker distance is also what the Odyssey auto calibration tool can set up for you but you can also come in here and manually set it yourself. And then finally you can get into level calibration which at the moment um, we're just pumping some sound through to the left. Alright, coming to the main menu once again, we get to the audio adjust where you can dictate what you're going to do in terms of multiplex um, audio and mono audio. So, um, obviously, whatever the input is, I would like it to send to the main speakers. Uh, you can vary that and say, no, nah, I just want the sub, I want the main and sub, etc. etc. Uh, mono input, how do you want to handle that? You want just the left channel to the right channel or just both. Returning to that sub menu, looking at Dolby, here we can see, well, when you have a two channel input, what would you like to do to it? Um, would you like it to uh, be in a panorama mode, yes or no? Um, what sort of dimension would that, when the sound field is, is a forward or back of your seating position? And how wide, what's the breadth of the sound like? Um, Dolby Digital EX, that's uh, 6.1 surround sound I think for memory, um, that's automatic. So with the DVD player sends it a 6.1 surround mix, it will actually determine that. Okay. Otherwise you can always force it by going into manual mode or I'll just keep it on automatic. And then finally True HD loudness management is on, so it enables late night and dialogue uh, normalization for True HD. Um, I think I do not own any True HD content, so I've never found that mode. Just finishing off this menu really quickly, DTS is how it's going to handle um, DTS Neo um, for like, music, and Theta Dimensional is how wide apart are your center speakers? Are they wide, are they normal, narrow, etc., etc. All right, let's keep it moving. Looking now at our source setup, you can um, go through the Odyssey menu and um, enable um, uh, how you're going to configure the sound. Intelligent volume or IntelliVolume as Onkyo call it, that automatically tries to um, limit um, the sound um, that's created by certain uh, noises that are quick and sharp and dynamic. Uh, I've got no control over that at the moment, which is zero decibels. Number three, we've got AV sync mode. If you manually want to configure the delay between your image in source and uh, the output, um, as you can see here, I've got a 90 millisecond delay between my um, DVD player and the amplifier. Um, you can actually do lip sync, which uh, I also have enabled through HDMI, and you'll see that in a second. Name edit, as I said before, you can edit the names of your inputs. Picture adjust um, in here. Um, it determines the aspect ratio of the output. Obviously, um, if it's a wide mode, you want it to be automatic. And in terms of picture mode, what that means is, will the AV receiver actually alter the picture, which you can do? Or in my case, I'd rather it didn't, so I keep it on direct, because I find the projector has a lot better modes of handling color recalibration and all that sort of stuff. 
Alright, listening mode preset is where you can actually determine how the amplifier is going to handle the input um, sound that it receives and how it's going to output it, which is very handy because uh, I've got four different sources coming in and typically almost all of them should just be in the source mode that they came in. But that said, you can configure it. So if I have a two channel in source from my DVD player, most likely it's an audio CD. And so in that case, I wanted to put out to all the speakers in the room, which I've got to say sounds really awesome. But conversely, if I get Dolby Digital, DTS, TrueHD or any DTS feed, I would like it to be unedited, direct and processed as is. Okay, you can actually um, go to different styles if you like to, straight to code, ProLogic 2, Dolby EX, Neo, etc, etc. But I find there's no need to do that, so I keep it in direct mode. Okay, so all those different menus there, you can see they will actually, um, you can configure every single input you've got. With the volume set up, you can um, determine what level when the amplifier turns on, what the output level will be at. Okay, and then on screen setup, um, obviously you, in my case, I like having the ability to look at what I'm looking at instead of having to look at the little LCD screen at the bottom. And screen saver, yeah, no need for that. With the hardware setup, a few interesting things going here which I'll have to delve into a bit further. Uh, the tuner, that's just going to determine the AM frequency um, step rate. Uh, I never listen to AM so I never bother with that. HDMI, okay, so do you want HDMI control um, on or off? That means to say that you know some devices they can actually send signals backwards and forwards. Um, so if you press play on your Onkyo amplifier, it will control a Sony um, enabled HDMI control. Thing and it will fast for the DVD player. Um, I find it sometimes not uh, the best thing to do and if anything it causes issues so I keep it off. HDMI through, so um, if you want the, t the unit to be in standby mode but you still want to be able to watch TV in my instance on um, in the study, you can do that. So the amplifier is basically passively always sending the signal via HDMI to the TV, but in doing so you're going to be using a little bit of power which I believe is seriously just one watt. So um, it's no great uh, cause if you do that. Um, oops, jumped out there. Um, audio TV out. Now this is the big one. If ever I watch a, um, a 7.1 surround sound mix or master uh, Dolby Digital, I have to turn this off. So that what that happens there is, is that the sound to the TV in a study will cease and therefore the processor on the amplifier can actually um, process that more complex surround sound mix. Now I really don't understand why that is because on one, I'm not powering any speakers in zone two and two, I, I can't see why it's that difficult. But it's a problem nonetheless because invariably my wife and I will watch a movie at night and then the next day my son will come to do the PlayStation on the TV and he doesn't get any sound to the TV. Lip sync, um, as I mentioned earlier, you can configure manually the, the delay between um, any of your source components or conversely if it's um, built into your devices, you can um, let it automatically sync between the two. And that Insta Preview is what we um, looked at earlier. Auto standby, if nothing comes into the amplifier, it will automatically turn off. Good idea. Network, um, that's to configure uh, manually if you want to, your um, IP address, MAC address, etc. etc. And initial setup, let's pretend that this is a brand new amplifier. It's the first time out of the box. We've got everything connected. As you can see here, you can actually go through it where the Odyssey 2EQ will go through its auto set up, we'll do source connection, remote setup and network connection. So I'm not going to do that, so I'm going to have to press home. That might jump us out a bit there. Okay, and finishing off, um, you can get this remote control to um, do, um, you know, control other source components by other different manufacturers, but um, I've got the Harmony remote control for that purpose. And then finally, you can lock your setup. So if you're afraid your kids are going to go stuff around your amplifier, um, you can always lock it down there. Just a few more notes before I finish this long-term review. Note that this is firmware 11510108 Wow! What does that mean? Well, I'll tell you what it means. Um, I have never updated this amplifier out of the box. I've seen plenty of online forums which um, tell about problems you have um, in one performing the update. They recommend do it via USB stick. 
Um, two, that when you do update to whatever next version is or the version after that, there are HDMI issues um, with switching stability output. So um, I was definitely forewarned by the forums to not update, so I never have. One of the other big issues I have with Zembify is his inability to do 3D out without me coming in here and actually having to turn the output, not from both, but to main. Um, kind of annoying, again, just like my example earlier, whereby if um, someone wants to watch TV the following day after we watch a 3D movie, invariably the HDMI to Zone 2 will be turned off, and so they'll go turn it on, and no picture goes there. So then you have to get the uh, remote control out and go back to this menu and go, yep, please output to both. Okay, so again, not a biggie, but nonetheless, it's uh, you know, an issue that you definitely should be aware of. Do I love this amplifier? Yes and no. Look, I know it's relatively cheap and for $650, I really can't complain. And there's a lot of things that other manufacturers charge at least $900 upwards. Um, it has a very similar sound quality to that of the Yamaha brand. That is, it's kind of sweet, a little bit um, melodic, not so sharp compared to, I think, what Sony amplifiers are like. And um, be known that I actually have had both Sony, Yamaha, and this now Onkyo amplifier. And of all the amplifier sounds I prefer, I'd have to say absolutely Yamaha, but um, Budget-wise, I just couldn't stretch to um, go to the uh, high level that Yamaha requires for dual HDMI out, so I had to compromise to this one. And so, let's have a listen to what it's really like. Think you're smart, huh? Well, the guy that hired news, they'll just do the same to you. Simple makes you. Stranger. 